Good morning. Good evening. Welcome to the ANS first ever digital gala. It is a pleasure to be with you today, tonight, wherever you are. I welcome you to your dear ANS and I hope you enjoyed your cabinet conversations. I wish so much I were right now sitting with you surrounded by joyful faces, enjoying the speakers, good food, and uh, nice wine. Thank you, Mary. I know you're watching. I truly hope that this Zoom society will not become the forever new norm. However, we cannot deny that this technology is today allowing us to welcome to our gala many more people than usual from all five continents and many of its 24 time zones. This is how large our family has become, and we are all today at the same table. When we started planning for this event, we believed we were on our own. Who would donate for a virtual gala? We reached out to our, to our generous friends. Their response was overwhelming. I remember several of you saying, this year is no different. The NS deserves the same level of support. On behalf of all the NS staff and the board of trustees, thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. We thank as well the numerous supporters who purchased raffle tickets and wish them good luck. Stay put until the end of our program. A technical note now. This online program mixes live and recorded speakers, a film and a live event. While most of the staff works from home, it is a challenge. If something goes wrong, please forgive us. And whatever happens, join me in thanking the NS staff for its very hard work during this challenging period. This year, we are honoring Lottie and Mark Salton. More qualified speakers than I will tell you more about their fascinating life and achievements. I wish I've had the privilege of meeting them in person. My encounter with them was quite different. During New York City shutdown last spring, I used to bike to the office once a week to check our mail. And one day, I found a large envelope addressed to the American Numismatic Society dated May 19, reference a state of Lottie Salton. I read with emotion on page six that the sum of $500,000 had been endowed to the American Numismatic Society. This is the largest single bequest I've had the privilege to witness since I joined the ANS in 2012. But there is more to share about Lottie Salton's last will. No fewer than 14 charitable and non-for-profit organizations were listed in that document. One of her major gifts incorporated an intriguing condition. A sign was to be posted in a medical library to the memory of Alexander Velenzik and Franz Duver of Amsterdam, Netherlands. I researched the names. Mr. Velenzik, a writer among the nations, had rescued Max Schlesinger, later Mark Salton, as well as another refugee in the summer of 1942, at great personal risk. He survived the war. Franz Duver was not so lucky. His printing and publishing house produced about 150 fake IDs, food coupons, baptismal certificates, and house visor in 1942 and 1943, secretly on Sundays to avoid surveillance. Duver was arrested on June 8, 1944 and killed two days later. Please join me in honoring Lottie Salton and thanking her for keeping their memories and legacies alive. It is a true honor today to welcome our keynote speaker, Jacob Goldstein. He's the author of Money, the True Story of a Made-Up Thing the co-host of NPR's Planet Money and a frequent contributor to the New York Times Magazine and other significant medias. He will be followed by the first release of a movie produced for the NS by world-recognized artist and photographer Pascal Perich. Then we will listen to Dr. Ute Wartenberg, NS president and former long-term executive director, 
before the honoris presentation by NS Life Fellow, Dr. Ara Rizak, and Princeton University's Curator of Numismatics, Dr. Alan Stahl. We will end with a fun part, don't hang up. Who is going to win the 24 items generously offered for the ANS 2021 Gala Raffle? I will repeat a couple of more times very briefly, this is a promise. Without further ado, Mr. Jacob Goldstein. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak. It's really an honor. I wanna tell a story that I think is a good fit for this group, for a group dedicated to the study of money, because the story reveals the really profound connections between physical money itself and the material well-being of an entire society. The story starts a thousand years ago in Sichuan province in China, where people mostly used iron coins for money. And in a world where the value of a coin was based on the value of the metal it was made of, iron was a really bad thing to use for money. To buy a pound of salt, you needed a pound and a half of iron coins. Think of having to do all your grocery shopping with pennies. So sometime just before 1000 AD, a merchant in Sichuan had an idea. He started letting people leave their iron coins with him and in exchange for the coins, he would give people fancy standardized paper receipts. The receipts were like coat check tickets for coins. Pretty soon, rather than go to the trouble of getting their coins every time they wanted to make a purchase, people started using the coat check receipts to buy stuff. The paper itself turned into money. Other merchants started issuing their own paper receipts, and within a few years, the government took over the business of printing paper money. And paper money spread to other provinces around China. Now, to be clear, the Chinese government had been using paper for financial instruments for a while by this point, but this was the moment paper really became money when people routinely started using it to buy stuff. So here's a bill from the 12th century. Actually, no original paper specimen survived from this moment, but a metal plate that was used to print the paper bill survives. And this was printed from that plate. Uh, and as was common at the time, a big chunk of the bill was taken up by a warning. Uh, here's, here's this warning. It says, by imperial decree, Criminals who counterfeit this bill are to be punished by beheading. The reward for informers shall be 1,000 guan. If accomplices of counterfeiters or any who harbor them willingly identify the ringleaders to the authorities, they'll be absolved of criminal liability and given the above stipulated reward. This very elaborate warning was not entirely successful. This plate itself is probably a counterfeit. That's according to Richard von Glan, who's the preeminent American scholar on early Chinese money. But despite the counterfeiting, paper money was a hit. Remember, this was a time when transporting large quantities of heavy coins was risky. It was expensive. So paper money was a technological breakthrough. You know, it made it much easier to move money around. Scholars describe an economic revolution at this moment in Chinese history, hundreds of years before Europe's own industrial revolution. Paper money made trade much easier. It meant workers were able to specialize, become more productive. Around this time, movable type and the magnetic compass were invented in China. Farmers figured out agricultural techniques that let them grow far more rice in the same amount of space. Markets and money made cities. At a time when fewer than 100,000 people lived in London or Paris, two Chinese cities grew to more than a million people each. So by the year 1200, China was quite possibly the richest, most technologically advanced civilization in the world. And then the Mongols rode in. In 1215, Genghis Khan's army captured what is now Beijing. 45 years later, his grandson Kublai was elected Great Khan and took control of the biggest empire in the world. The Mongols were nomads and they loved how much easier it was to move paper money compared to metal coins. They understood that speed meant wealth. So the year Kublai became great Khan, he created a new kind of paper money to be used across vast swaths of his empire. Uh, here is a paper note printed not long after this moment. Uh, if you look closely at the bottom of that orange seal there, you can see a picture of strings of coins. This was a common feature of Chinese paper money. It was a way of showing how many coins a bill was worth. 
Kublai Khan ordered people across much of his empire to accept his paper money. Uh, and the famous European traveler Marco Polo arrived in China around this time. And he tells us that it worked. He says, quote, this paper money is circulated in every part of the great Khan's dominions, nor dares any person at the peril of his life refuse to accept it in payment. And then Kublai Khan made a very bold move. He issued a new kind of paper money. The paper still had pictures of coins on it, but they were just pictures. This money could not be redeemed for metal. This truly was a radical experiment. It was money as almost pure abstraction, backed by nothing. There was some inflation, but it worked. Partly, this is a testament to the sheer power of the Mongol state. Use this paper as money or I'll kill you. But partly, after 300 years of using paper money, people in China had figured out that paper money worked not because it was backed by bronze or iron, but because everybody agreed that paper could be used as money. I mean, at least, paper money worked for a while. In the 1300s, a rebellion pushed the Mongols out of China, and a new dynasty was founded, the Ming Dynasty. The new rulers wanted to take China back to this idealized past before China's economic revolution. They dreamed of a nation of self-sufficient agricultural villages. So they started to get rid of those economic changes that had driven China's economic revolution. And in the 1400s, after several waves of inflation, the Ming Dynasty even abandoned paper money. The emperor had succeeded in dragging China back to the past. The average person in China wound up poorer than her ancestors had been hundreds of years earlier. Today, we take economic growth and scientific discoveries as given. You know, if the economy shrinks even a little bit for a few seasons in a row, we declare it a recession. And we wonder what the problem is. We wonder when things will get better. But one important lesson of this story is this. Economic growth and technological change are not guaranteed to continue forever. Development is not a one-way street. Sometimes civilizations become poorer generation after generation. Sometimes money itself disappears. We live in an amazing economic moment and we shouldn't take it for granted. Thank you so much, dear Jacob, for this insightful trip into the nature of money. Now, movie time. Pascal Perich is a world recognized artist and photographer. He has been portraying personalities such as presidents, writers, politicians, and diplomats, working for a range of prominent media, among them the Financial Times Magazine, Fortune, Gala, Gotham, Elle, Playboy, Jeune Afrique, El Pais, The New York Times, Newsweek, La Vanguardia, and many others while contributing to major art publications. Pascal had never heard about VNS before, and you should have witnessed his excitement and enthusiasm in the vault and the library when he discovered our collections for the first time. This movie translates his fascination for what animates us all. The NS is proud to share today for the first time the movie The NS Yesterday, Today and Tomorrow, realized by Pascal Perich. Let's time travel begin. Greetings, my name is Agnes Baldwin Brett. In 1909, the American Numismatic Society hired me as its first paid curator. So much has changed since the society first started. On March 15, 1858, a 16-year-old named Augustus B. Sage hosted a gathering at his family's home in New York City. His idea was to dedicate a society to collecting research and education about any and all matters numismatic. Young Augustus even donated our first object, this 1825 half cent. Many early members gifted incredible objects to the newly founded society, including fascinating Civil War tokens and wonderful early American medals. However, for years we lacked adequate housing for our growing collection. Nearly 50 years after the first meeting, Archer Huntington, a philanthropist from one of America's wealthiest families, became president of the ANS and made a dynamic impact. Following his appointment, Huntington oversaw the construction of a beautiful new headquarters on Audubon Terrace in Upper Manhattan, where he employed our first formal staff. 
This is when I began my time at the Society. I studied classical languages, art, and archaeology at Barnard as one of the first women of my generation to attend college. I went on to complete a master's in archaeology at Columbia, where I later lectured. I even received a fellowship to study in Athens, and I published widely about Greek and Roman numismatics. While women have long played an important role in our organization, I am proud to know that we have recently elected our very first woman president. Along with Huntington, another colorful character from my time was the absolutely brilliant Edward T. Newell. Newell's diligent scholarship transformed our society in the first half of the 20th century. He amassed an enormous collection of mostly ancient coins. He and his wife, Adra, ultimately left us with over 100,000 objects, our largest donation, and one of the most significant in the whole history of the field. Look at this rare electrum coin, a stator with a winged horse, which was minted in the late 6th century BC. It is one of the many extraordinary coins that Mr. Newell donated. Along with the Newell donations, John Riley brought another important expansion to the Society's holdings. Riley's passion for Asian numismatics, and Chinese coins in particular, was truly astounding. His collection of over 30,000 objects, as well as his extensive library, was given to the ANS by his daughter Frances in 1937, making our East Asian department one of the most important in the world. Riley's comprehensive archive is still being catalogued today. The American coins the Society has assembled, too, are outstanding. I am thrilled to be able to see the incredibly rare Brasher doubloon. As someone who conducted so many dye studies, I find the Society's collection of large scents, donated by George H. Clapp, immensely impressive. The library, named after Harry Bass from Texas, one of America's great collectors and businessmen, today has grown to one of the largest and most comprehensive numismatic libraries in the world. We have probably over 100,000 volumes. While new hands hold old coins, one thing has markedly changed the efforts to digitize the collection. I started the very first card file of coin images from auction catalogs at the ANS. Just imagine what I could have done with modern technology. Harry Bass first envisioned the Society's technological achievements in the early 1980s. Since then, scholars and collectors can access much of our collection, library, and archives remotely, with high-quality images being added every day. The ANS today has, and I hope I am saying this right, websites, online databases, blogs, YouTube videos, and even whole books right at a click of a button. Hundreds of thousands of visitors use ANS electronic resources. Lively gatherings keep taking place between people sitting in five different continents through these magic links. Every year, the ANS hosts graduate students from all around the world for the summer seminar. Back in the 1930s, following Edward Newell's commitment to education and research, Eric P. Newman endowed the most important educational program of the society. Not only did Mr. Newman generously fund the summer seminar, but he also gifted the society a range of extraordinary Islamic coins, which I've learned are now worth many millions of dollars. In recent years, ANS Chairman Kenneth Edlow and other generous donors have enriched the Society with donations of thousands of Iberian, Islamic, and European coins previously owned by Archer Huntington himself, a contribution that will not soon be forgotten. Other recent acquisitions include the amazing and almost complete collection of Jewish and Sumerian coins donated by the Honorable Abraham Sofer and Marion Shore Sofer. Seeing the ANS today with our robust membership, extensive research library, and over 800,000 objects in the collection is marvelous to me. As I look back to our beginnings and look ahead to our future, I am reminded of our motto, Parva ne pereant, Latin for may the small things not perish. The ANS has been around for more than 162 years and yet continues to expand to new territory with every passing year. 
I am proud to be part of the history of this organization committed to such small objects rich with information. In my day, I donated hundreds of coins and contributed financially. Help us continue this amazing work by leaving a legacy. New money keeps our old money as part of a shared history. What a beautiful film. It, it really captures the spirit of the American Numismatic Society. I'm Ute Wartenberg, uh, the newly elected president of the society. And um, I welcome you all to my our living room here. Um, the society would really not be where it is today with our extraordinary collection that you just saw but also our dedicated staff, a board of trustees, second to none, and programs that are growing all the time. Most importantly, we have a loyal membership, and I'm so happy to see that many of you have joined us today. The last year has been hard for many of us. We've lost some dear friends, uh, such as ANS fellow Jay Golds, our trustee Joel Anderson and our former president Donald Patrick, as well as a few others. We will miss them and all the others that have passed away in the last year. ANS as an institution, I should say, has done quite well over the last 12 months. We've kept our programs going, uh, we developed new ones and for financially, to our great surprise, we've done much better than expected. Um, our endowment has grown to over $53 million now. Much of our ability to cope with difficult situations such as this pandemic has been due to the visionary leadership of our predecessors. I salute them, and in particular, Sid Martin, our president who just retired from this position. His health does not allow him to be with us today but I know in spirit, he is here with us. So I welcome you all to our gala um, 2021. Um, no doubt we will remember this one. And I would like to thank the staff of the society for pulling this off. It's been a lot of work, I've seen it. This gala is also special for a different reason. Um, as we normally bestow the Trustees Award to friends and supporters uh, who are alive or with us during the event. This year, we honor two outstanding individuals, Mark and Lottie Salton, who've passed away. Both were longstanding ANS supporters, and Alan Stahl and Ira Rizak will speak about them in a moment. Let me just say a few words about Lottie Salton, who passed away in 2020. I knew um, Mrs. Salton well, um, and this is actually how I called her all the time. I never called her by her first name, and she always called me Dr. Wartenberg. It was a very German conversation normally. I think I spoke to her every month, twice or three times for probably over a decade. And over those years, we developed a close relationship where she told me some of her extraordinary history, which for me as a German was particularly painful to hear. Um, but her interest in numismatic topics, the ANS, my family or personal matters, all these conversations, sometimes they went on for hours, supported me during many occasions. Uh, she meant a lot to me, in particular, as this is not a field of many women. I do miss her. Mark and Lottie Sultan were, of course, distinguished members of the international community of numismatists, and this event today shows this. They were collectors, researchers, and generous donors to many institutions. Studying and writing that was important. And if you want to understand their deep level of learning, 
I recommend you read the citations that Mark Salton composed as the long-standing chair of the Huntington Committee. Now, just as we will remember the names that we just heard in our film um, of Huntington, Newell, Club, or Sophia and, and Ken Edlow, who I believe are with us today, um, as well as so many other names in our great history, the name Sultan will be now attached to the most generous bequest that Jill mentioned forever to the chair of medieval European and Renaissance numismatics here at the Society. So before introducing the speakers, let me thank you all for your help, for all the sponsors, the guests and the staff for making this such a successful event. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ira Rizak, a physician with a speciality in pulmonology. He's been a member, he's well known to many of you, a supporter of the society, a fellow for many, many decades. His expertise of Judaica and numismatics has made him a well-known speaker all over the world. And as a close friend, long-term friend of the Sultans, he was at their side for very many years. Dr. Alan Stahl, our second speaker, speaker needs no introduction. He's the curator of numismatics at Princeton University where he's worked since 2004 Prior to this appointment, he served for two decades as curator of medieval coinage and medals at the Society. Dr. Stoll is one of the leading experts in medieval and early modern numismatics, as well as medallic art, fields in which he has published many books and many important contributions. Ira, Alan, over to you. Thank you. I'd like to share with you something of the story of my friends, Lottie and Mark Salton. I first got to know Mark and Lottie in 1975, soon after their return from a decade in Italy, where Mark was vice president of manufacturers Hanover, responsible for Italy and the Mediterranean region. We met at a New York International Coin Convention, and because of many kindred interests, soon became good friends. Of course, there was the numismatic connection. I've been a collector of coins and medals since childhood, but it was my own lifelong engagement with Jewish culture and history, which corresponded to the Sultan's own deep-seated identities and experiences as Jews of the 20th century that immediately fostered an intimate bond between us. We celebrated holidays together in each other's homes and exchanged details of our life stories. Mark and Lottie were, in the original meaning of the word, familiars, family, for me, and soon as well for my wife, Brigitte, like them, of European birth. Lottie and Mark were both born in Germany, Mark in 1914, Lottie in 1924, but in different circumstances. Mark's father, Joel Felix Schlesinger, born in Mainz in 1879, had initially trained as a banker but he was a nephew of Leo Hamburger, the principal of a prestigious numismatic firm in Frankfurt on the Main. And in 1911, he joined that firm. After years of frontline service where he was wounded during World War I, Felix later formed his own numismatic establishment, moving it to Berlin in 1928, where it became prominent, auctioning, for example, Greek and Russian duplicates of the Hermitage as late as 1935. Mark's mother, Hedwig, was a descendant of the well-known Munich Feuchtwanger family that included the famous novelist, Lion Feuchtwanger, and also Louis Feuchtwanger, the pharmacist who came to America in the 1820s and invented Feuchtwanger's composition, so-called German silver, an alloy used to produce tokens in the United States. Thus, Mark Salton, originally Max Schlesinger, was born in Frankfurt, trained there in banking and numismatics, moved with his family to Berlin in his youth, and from his earliest years was immersed and trained in an exceptionally rich numismatic environment. Lottie Ehrenstein, on the other hand, lived in Wienenberg in Westphalia, where her father Paul was a prosperous merchant, a dealer in horses and a landowner. He was the town's most prominent citizen, but also 
the head of the only Jewish family living there. Anti-Semitism played no role in Marx and Lottie's early experience, but that changed dramatically with the advent of the Nazi regime in 1933. In Vrindenberg, 11-year-old Lottie was still a student in the local school in 1935, but thereafter she was expelled. On November 9th, 1938, the infamous Kristallnacht of Nazi terror, she and her entire family fled their home that very night, suddenly and irrevocably. With her younger brother in tow, Lottie at 14, was soon parted from her parents, a separation that lasted for years until the later reunion in New York. She was interned in Gourse, a concentration camp in Southern France, but then managed to cross over to Morocco after which she gained passage to America, arriving in New York in 1941. Still a teenager, Lottie went to work, of course, and became an accomplished expert at the precise task of cutting diamonds. Mark's family escaped to Amsterdam in 1935, rebuilt their numismatic business, and carried on until May 1940, when the Nazis invaded Holland ordered personally to report for deportation to the East in mid-1942, Mark went underground and with a friend crossed France and Spain, ultimately reaching Lisbon, where he joined the free Dutch forces opposing the Nazis. Two stories worth retelling are among the many that Mark shared with me. On the first day of the Nazi invasion of the Netherlands, May 10th, 1940, the Dutch government imposed a strict curfew requiring everyone to stay indoors. Mark's mother was gravely ill, so Mark went out to secure medication, but he was caught by a military patrol. When his German accent was detected, he was accused of being a Nazi agent and threatened with summary execution. He protested that he was a Jewish refugee. Fortunately, a captain in charge happened to be Jewish and challenged Mark to recite the first sentences of the book of Genesis in Hebrew. Mark, an Orthodox Jew, had no problem passing that test. A second story is numismatic. The Nazis confiscated the Schlesinger library, stock, and collections. But before they did, Mark's father asked a trusted neighbor to hide a few items. One of these was a 12-inch bronze casting of a model for a 1920 Dutch medal of Jewish interest commemorating the San Remo conference of that year. This medallion had been offered for sale in the May 1940 price list of the Schlesinger firm in Amsterdam, issued in the very month of the German invasion, but it had not been sold. Mark's parents were subsequently deported to Theresienstadt concentration camp and then in 1944 to the Auschwitz death camp where they were murdered. After the war, Mark and his brother Paul retrieved the medallion in question from their former neighbors, and it was left for sale later with Hans Schulman in New York when the Sultans departed for Italy in 1966. It happened that before even meeting Mark and Lottie, Without knowing of the 1940 listing or anything of the history just recounted, I chanced upon this medallion at Schulman's and bought it. It's a sequence of events that might hardly be credited were it not true. To return to the immediate post-war period, Mark arrived in New York from Lisbon via Baltimore in 1946. He was advised by well-meaning friends that with the German name Max Schlesinger, his path to acceptance in America would be difficult, and so was persuaded to change his name to Mark M. Salton, a change he came greatly to regret. Mark returned to the banking career for which he'd originally trained, and after first securing a master's degree in international banking at NYU, under the supervision of the distinguished economist Henry Kaufman, Mark ultimately rose to a vice presidency at manufacturer Hanover. Mark and Lottie married in 1948, three months after first meeting. Mark, though a full-time banker, rekindled his numismatic interests and became a home-based dealer under the name 
Mark M. Sultan Dash Schlesinger during the 1950s and 1960s. He and now Lottie too were keen and of course highly knowledgeable collectors of coins and medals. So during the early post-war period, they were able to assemble and in some sense replace the valuable collection of coins and medals that had been seized by the Nazis in 1940. As many of you may know, the Sultans freely lent rare items from their holdings for exhibitions and also became generous numismatic philanthropists, donating many rare coins selectively to museums, public institutions, the American Numismatic Society preeminent among them. My friend, Alan Stoll, is in a unique position to expand on this phase of the Sultan's numismatic legacy. Bork and Lottie Sultan were sophisticated representatives of an older culture, now disappeared. Their friendship was important to me and to many others. Their generosity lives on. The traditional Jewish phrase of remembrance, zichronam livracha, considers them, quote, of blessed memory. Shortly after coming to New York at the end of World War II, Mark joined the American Numismatic Society in 1946. He went back to Italy to work for the bank, but came back to New York in the mid 1970s and immediately became active at the ANS in 1976, joining the Advisory Committee on Medals and Decorations. In 1979, he became a fellow of the American Numismatic Society, and in 1980, a member of the Huntington Award Committee that selected a scholar for lifetime achievement in numismatics. In 1983, the ANS decided to reorganize the committee that gave the J. Sanford Schultes Medal for Signal Achievement in the Art of the Medal. Since its founding in the early 20th century, the Saltis Award had been given by a jury made up of previous winners of the award. However, it seemed to work out that the selection of an artist fell into a smaller and smaller circle of artists to the point at which the 1980 Saltis recipient Agap Ab Agapov was hardly recognized as one of the great producers of medallic art. In fact, most of his work was rather conventional work for the National Commemorative Society, which was a branch of the Franklin Mint. Mark was among the leading members of the Medals Committee who sought to have the ANS change the basis of this selection. And in the end, the ANS Council agreed to set the committee to include as a chair a medalist, Robert Weinman, a very distinguished one, but also collectors and scholars of medals, and to open up the competition to non-Americans. The first Saltis recipient under this new policy was actually brought to the committee by Mark Salton, who had encountered his work in Italy. Guido Veroy was a perfect choice to bridge the camps of traditional and modernist. Certainly, you can see in the metal here that he followed a rather traditional approach to the composition of the metal. In fact, one could almost say a Renaissance approach, a Pisanello approach, if you will, but brought his own expression and his own sense of design to it. In 1984, in recognition of their donations to the ANS, Mark and Lottie Sultan, the became benefactors, and in 1990, Mark became chair of the Huntington Medal Committee, and in that capacity, read the citations to most of 
these Huntington Award winners in the following decade. In the course of 50 years from 1949 to 2000, Mark and Lottie Salton donated over 1,750 coins and medals, all in memory of Felix Schlesinger, Mark's father who had been murdered at Auschwitz. The first gift by the Saltons to the ANS was fittingly enough a Renaissance medal of Niccolo Orsini by Cristoforo Caradossa, a rather small medal, but quite rare and of early cast. In the course of the years, Mark and Lottie Salton donated to many departments of the ANS, to the Greek department. There was this beautiful silver tetradram of Abdera in Thrace from the early fifth century. One of the things the ANS curators most appreciated in the Salton's giving was that they, at the beginning of every year, would make up a list of coins and medals which they were willing to donate and distribute the gift, the list to the various curators to choose those that would actually fill gaps in the collection. Not all of the gifts were in themselves either valuable or rare. In many cases, the gifts were given to give depth to a collection, as is the case here, this denarius of Septimius Severus in the name of his son Geta is not in and of itself terribly important. However, it was one of 143 denarii of this reign that the Sultans donated, and this was only one reign in which they strove to give the ANS unequal depth in the, the Roman field. As curator of medieval coins, I was particularly pleased with Mark's gift in 1982 of a hoard of very small, not terribly attractive, not terribly valuable, but a hoard of 329 denarii of medieval Italy, which came with the information on the hoard find and therefore was of enormous value in being able to attribute these coins, which have no ruler's name, simply the name of a city and a state, both chronologically and in the case of this penny that says it's in Arezzo, actually to the mint of Cortona. Some of the donations of the Sultans were in and of themselves spectacular, such as this gold three ducat piece of Sigismund III of Poland, the largest gold coin of Poland we acquired. Mark and Lottie's donations to the ANS came to an end in 2000, and in 2006, Mark died. In 2009, the ANS initiated the Mark Salton Memorial Lecture. Lottie Salton died in 2020, and as a trustee of her estate, I was especially pleased to see this provision in her will, giving to the ANS a, an endowment to be used by the American Numismatic Society for the establishment of a curatorship of European coinage in the name of Mark Salton, a lasting tribute to a great numismatist and friend of the ANS. Thank you, Ira. Thank you, Alan. Now is a fun part. We have 24 lots to give away from ancient Athenian owls to modern medals, rare books, and even sapphires. Here is a process. Emma Pratt, our master designer, will use a metallic cylinder in which all the tickets have been placed. 
Each time she picks up a ticket, hosting or membership wizard will determine who is the winner. We will then reach out to you in the coming weeks to sort out the actual shipment. Let the fun begin. Hello, this is the moment you've all been waiting for, I'm sure. So I have my golden drum of tickets. I hope everybody has their numbers ready. But if not, like Gilles said, we have everything ready for you. All right, so let's begin. Okay, so first up, we have the Centennial Exposition Medal from 1876. Three spins. And the number is 68048. Again, that is 68048. So this is a large bronze piece made for the Centennial Exposition Exhibition. And the winner is? The winner of this Centennial Exposition Medal goes to Adam Crum, who is a guest of our Gala Benefactor in GC. Congratulations to Mr. Crum. All right, well, next up, we have the Francis Tavern Museum Medal from 1976. Couple turns. And the number is 68495. Again, the number is 68495. So this is a medal in platinum done by the Benalic Art Company for the biennial celebration. And the winner is? The winner of this medal is Dr. Alain Baron, one of our gala benefactors. All right, so next up we have Luigi Brunacchi catalog. And the number is 66986. Again, that is 66986. So this is from 1958 and it catalogs Count Luigi Bernacchi's collection of Roman Republic, Greek, Roman Empire, Byzantine, and coins from Italian and foreign mints. And the winner is? The winner of this book, this catalog is Robert Ronas, one of our gala supporters. Congratulations. All right, next up we have Oregon Trail Half Dollar from 1936. Got a number, and the number is six eight six six seven. Again, that is six eight six six seven. So this piece is one of only ten thousand and six coins ever struck, and was designed by the husband and wife pair of James Earl and Laura Garden Fraser, who are both actually Saltus Award winners. And the winner is. Winner of this uh, half dollar is Cass Tan, one of our ANS staff members. Oh, congratulations to Cass. Congrats to staff. All right, next up, we have the Athenian Tachygram donated by Michael Buell. Couple turns. And the number is 68137. Again, that is 68137. So this coin, I mean, this is a classic coin. We have Athena, the owl, it's a classic. The winner is? The winner of this Athenian tetradram is Mashiko, who is at the virtual table of Tony Terranova and actually one of our recent Saltus Award winners. Oh, congratulations, Mashiko. And thanks again to Michael Beal. Next up. We have the Chaplain's Medal from 1920. Couple spins. Let's pull from this side. And the number is 68737. Again, that is 68737. So this medal is also by Laura Garden Frazier. She was our first female Saltus Award winner. And this medal was given to from the Protestant Church to all chaplains serving in the Army or Navy during World War I. It's a beautiful piece of art. The winner is? Uh, the winner of, of this medal is Carol Ann Mincy Collier, 
who is one of our gala supporters. Oh, well, congratulations. Caroline. Next up. Oh, the two cent piece. Now you can, we're gonna give somebody our two cents. Here we go. <laughs> this is a dark joke for you guys. This one, the number is six eight four five eight. Again, that is six eight four five eight. So this piece is one of only nine hundred and sixty struck made in eighteen seventy one. And the winner is. Uh, the winner of, uh, of our two cents is Keith Rezin, who is at the table of Shanna Schmidt. Congratulations, Mr. Rezin. Next we have, oh, the green sapphire. All right, donated by Keith Barron. And the number is 68077. Again, that is 68077. So this is 0.97 carats from the Rock Creek Sapphire Mine in Montana, square cushion cut style. Again, thank you to Keith Barron for this donation. And the winner is? Uh, the winner of this green sapphire is Dan Hamelberg, one of our gala patrons. <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Hamelberg. All right, next up, we have our ninth item, which is the Dorm, Dorm, Dormus and Dixon Merchant Token from 1850 to 1853. Okay, and the number is 68807. Again, that is 68807. So this piece is from the mid 19th century. It's a New York City token. And the, which is it? The obverse labels it as dry goods and upholstery for ships and steamers. And the winner is? The winner of this token is individual supporter, Wendy Hanford. Oh, congratulations to Wendy. All right, next up we have the Enrico Caruso coin catalog. The number is 68816. Again, that is 68816. So this catalog is from 1923 and it catalogs the uh, collection, his gold collection. He was an Italian opera tenor. And the winner is? Uh, the winner of this coin collection catalog is Peter Weiss. Uh, uh, both an individual supporter of the gala and one of our raffle donors. Congratulations, device. All right, next up we have the Medal for a Jewish Orphanage in 1865, generously donated by Shanna Schmidt. And the number is Six six nine six one. Again, that is six six nine six one. So this piece uh, from eighteen sixty five was made to commemorate the opening of the Jewish orphanage. Um, the obverse features Caritas with two children, and the reverse is the facade of that beautiful building. And the winner is uh, the winner of this medal for the Jewish orphanage goes to Wayne Homron, who is a guest of our gala patrons. Dave and Judy Stein. Congratulations to Mr. Homren. All right, uh, next up, number 12, we have a U.S. Barber half dollar, 1908. And the number is 66980. Again, that is 66980. So this piece is a large silver coin from the penultimate year of the New Orleans Mint, again, from 1908. And the winner is? Uh, the winner of this half dollar is a guest of our raffle donor, Ed Waddell. Congratulations, Est guest of Ed. <laughs> All right, next up, we have 
The Groins Coin of Sardis, donated by Mary Landon. The number is 68378. Again, that is 68378. So this coin is from the second to first century BCE. Uh, the obverse is Dionysus, god of wine. And on the back is a panther with a broken spear in its mouth. Again, thank you to Mary Lane for this donation. And the winner is? Uh, the winner of this bronze coin goes to our patron, classical, the Classical Numismatic Group, CNG. All right. Next up, number 14. That means we have 10 more left. Here we go. The Katrina Trask Plaquette from 1907. And the number is 68019. Again, that is 68019. This pla uh, plaquette from 1907 features Katrina Trask, who was a patroness of the arts, and it is done by the one and only Victor David Brenner. And the winner is? The, uh, our Gallup benefactor, the Numismatic Guarantee Corporation, NGC. Congratulations to NGC. All right, next up we have one cent. Not many of you might have seen a piece like this before in your life, but here we go. The number is 68212. Again, that is 68212. This one is from 1909. Um, it is one of the most widely collected series in numismatic, and it's about uncirculated, this piece. And the winner is? Uh, the winner of this one cent piece goes to Jeff Kimetz, a guest of Gal Benefactor, Vilmar Numismatics. Congratulations. All right, next up we have, oh gosh, the plaque of Hippolyte Leroy. <laughs> Can make Bravo. One of Bravo. Oh, donated by Uta Wartenberg Kagan and Jonathan Kagan. Um, the number is 68798. Again, that is 68798. This one, um, Ippolit was a prominent Belgian sculptor and medalist. So this is just a beautiful piece of art. The winner is? Uh, the winner is individual supporter of the gala, Stephen Yozaitis, and I apologize for any name that I pronounce, much like uh, Ippolit's uh, name uh, with my, my North Carolina accent. <laughs> <laughs> All right, number 17. Up next, we have 1900 Lafayette dollar. Two spins. Let's pull from over here now. And the number is 68158. Again, that is 68158. So this one, again, is about uncirculated from 1900. It is the only dollar size classic commemorative coin with only 36,026 struck. And the winner is? Uh, the winner of this Lafayette dollar goes to Jim Nicewinter, a okay. guest of Gala Benefactor, Tony Terranova. Congratulations, Mr. Nice Winter. All right, what's up next? Number 18. One shilling and sixpence, a colonial note from 1776. All right, the number is 68748. Again, that is 68748. So this one, to be specific, is from June 19, 1776, and is one, one of only 9,000 of this denomination. So uh, the winner is? This one shilling and six pence piece also goes to our gala supporter, Carol Ann Mincy Collier. Oh, look at this. Congratulations, Ms. Collier. All right, and this one is the Cistercius of Rome, donated by Michael Beale. And the number is, oh, let me close it. The number is 
67996. Again, that is 67996. So this is what I personally picture as the Roman coin. Obverse is Nero, the reverse is Roma, holding victory from 54 to 68 CE. Again, thank you to Michael Beal for this donation. And the winner is? The winner of this Cistercius goes to Donald Edlow, who is a guest of Gala Benefactors, Ken and Mary Edlow. Congratulations to Donald Edlow. Next up, this is number 20, uh, white gold assigned coffee. I don't know where I come from. Let's pull them down here. Hopefully this is attributed to someone. The number is 67998. Again, that is 67998. So white gold is one of our hit publications. And this one is going to be signed by Dr. Warmberg and Dr. Van Alphen. And the winner is? Uh, the winner of the signed copy of White Gold is Donald Edlow, who is a guest of our Gala Benefactor, uh, Gala Benefactors, Ken and Mary Edlow. Well, congratulations to Donald. All right, next up, we have Aroma Denarius from 137 BCE, donated by Ed Waddell. Edward J. Waddell. And the number is 68759. Again, that is 68759. So this one has a helmeted bust of Mars on the obverse and an oath scene on the reverse featuring two warriors extending swords to touch a pig held by a kneeling third figure. And the winner is? The winner of this denarius is Elena Stoljaric, uh, our collections manager at the ANS. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I love it. Congratulations, Elena. Ooh, all right. Next up, we have the Carson City Mint Morgan dollar from 1882. All right. And the number is 68736. Again, that is 68736. So this piece is uncirculated from 1882 and it was struck at the famed Carson City Mint with fresh silver from the Comstock load, which is the largest silver hoard ever discovered in America. And the winner is? Uh, the winner of this Morgan dollar is also Carol Ann Mincy Collier. <laughs> I swear. Very lucky, like, very lucky we wish. All right, next up we have, oh, the blue sapphire. Again, donated by Keith Barron. This is our second to last item. All right, the number for the blue sapphire is 68321. Again, that is 68321. This one is 0.82 carats. Again, it is a cushion square cut style and from the Rock Creek Sapphire Mine in Montana. Thank you to Keith Barron. And the winner is? This goes to our gala benefactor, Kunker. Kunker, congratulations. Wasn't my card, fine. <laughs> the next one is? The final one is the Athenian Tetradram donated by Victor England, Eric McFadden, and Peter Rice. Here we go. The last item. Let's go deep into it. Here we go. And the number is 68674. Again, that is 68674. Um, this is from the fifth century BCE features Athena and the classic Athenian owl. And the winner is? The winner of this Athenian tetradram goes to Larry Stax and the Stax family. Congratulations, Larry Stax. All right, that concludes the raffle. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Austin. Um, so we are about to, to end our 2021 gala. 
Um, first of all, I'd like to say some, some people might, might have been surprised that a couple of staff won something, but actually uh, several of our donors generously donated uh, the tickets they purchased to VNS staff, which explains that we have some winners uh, among VNS. Um, it was not easy to organize these raffles. There was a lot of work. And I know we have three unallocated tickets, but we will figure out who they are. Uh, we, won't, we won't keep the lots uh, here. So <laughs> thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you to our sponsors and benefactors. And I'd like to thank you, particularly the hardworking and talented staff when we first thought about a, um, a virtual gala, I was naive enough to think oh, it's going to be easier than the usual uh, gala with, you know, the big dinner, wine, the tables and everything. Actually, it, wa it was more work. Um, and I'm so happy we, we managed to put everything together, um, thanks to the staff and our um, sponsors and uh, uh, benefactors. Um, I've been told today that quite many of you are not NS members. I hope this gala convinced you this is where you belong. You will enjoy unlimited access to our collections, our team, our research, and our successful and rapidly expanding online educational offer. Furthermore, you will join a thriving community. This is a nice family to be part of. I'm going to say au revoir. But the link won't be disconnected. So if you would like to continue to dialogue a chat, it's, it's fine. Enjoy you know, the rest of the day or the evening. And very soon, we will meet in person again. Thank you. <laughs>